Mount Saint Harris is one of the original sort of founding members of uh, the Toronto Cornish Association of the modern era, uh, and uh, has been very active since. Uh, she's a very active person all round. She's involved in all sorts of things. One of the things I know about is preserving buildings. She did got the Queen's. Uh, uh, what was it for you? Jubilee. Jubilee. Medal. <laughs> and uh, and she's been very much involved with her family, her other family in South Africa, uh, in Africa, East Africa, and has done a lot of research on uh, Emily Hobhouse. So I'll introduce. Before Anne begins, I'm one of the librarians here at St. Mike's Home. We just want to welcome the association and to thank you for your generous donation of the association's library. It is fully catalogued and available online. Um, you can uh, you can search for the Toronto Cornish Association and come up with 320 books that you have donated. You can search for John Antiak and come up with 200 books that have his book played in them. Um, and I particularly want to thank uh, Marion Stevens Cockroft, Ann Burke, and John White for all the work that they did in the preparation of the exhibit and the installation. And the only other thing I want to do is introduce our new chief librarian to you, who will say just a few words, and then Anne will talk the floor. Thank you. Thank you. I promise I will only take a minute. Although I have a tiny first in the So I'm Cheryl Hook, and I, I started here in January. So I want to welcome the members of the Toronto Cornish Association to the Kelly Library, and thank you all for your donation to the library. This, um, the event this evening is the first of four events that are planned and coordinated by the Kelly Library Exhibit Committee. And I think this event is a wonderful example of the types of collaborations that we are striving for in our outreach to the community. So it exemplifies the three elements that we're trying to pull together, community, curriculum, and identification, and our library materials, so showcasing the materials that we have. So thank you to everyone who worked to bring this event together tonight, and uh, thank you all for your time. Thank you. Uh, if I may uh, actually correct our esteemed president, I, I did not do the research for Emily Hawkhouse because uh, somebody did, and I, it's a fellow Cornishman, I called him and said, this is a fantastic book, I'd like to use it as a basis for a presentation, this was way back when, and is that okay with you? It's not quite for me, but me to me. So, um, so this is actually the work of the author, John Paul, good for him. Uh, the research that was mentioned now about East Africa is actually about World War I in East Africa, almost nobody knows this Korea campaign there, and the Western country actually. Can I speak up? Can yes, I speak up? Okay. Can you hear now? All right. Project lights. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, well, if you sat in front, you wouldn't have the problem. At any rate, um, that's another story. So tonight we're going to talk about Emily Hophouse because she was a phenomenal woman and she is what so I've been told to cut it down, so let's hope it makes sense now I cut it down, right? Emily Hobhouse was born in St. Eve, not St. Ive, near Liskard in 1860. She was one of those women who got left out of the literature of her own country. She was one of those women who stayed home to look after Papa or Mama, Papa in this case, and she was considered to well over the hill by 30. People didn't marry, women didn't marry much over 30 in those days, so once Papa died, she got some money, and she decided to do something with her life. 
when she was freed of the stultifying existence, she began to live a life of almost unimaginable adventure. She's espoused unpopular causes, yet her actions saved lives and even caused the laws of England to be changed. How extraordinary is that? At one point, she determined single-handedly to stop the First World War. <laughs> right. She didn't succeed, but she did cross from Switzerland into Germany and converse with the highest levels of the Nazi regime. What a woman. Given to impetuosity and indulging, as seen by others as obviously very bad decisions, she was often her own worst enemy. <laughs> From today's perspective, she would probably be considered bipolar. She was not referred to by Lord Kitchener as that bloody woman for nothing. <laughs> the Boer War, sometimes called the South African War or the Anglo Boer War, has interested me for some time. But I made no apology for declaring, right at the beginning of the talk, that I've taken, as I said, my talk from this book by John And yes, I did from it. In South Africa, Emily is a heroine. In England, and even in her native Cornwall, who is her heroine? In Cornwall, she had an insignificant funeral, officiated by an assistant curate and unreported in the newspapers. In South Africa, she was buried like a princess. The ceremony was impressive. The funeral oration was given by General Jan, Jan Smuts. Her, um, her, it, let me see. Her ashes were buried on Bloemfontein, the capital of the old Orange Free State, on October the 27th, 1926, at the National Women's Monument. Only two people had been buried there before her. They were not only national heroes, but her close friends, President Stein and General Dewey. What happened to my picture? <laughs> That's what happens when you get a husband doing it. <laughs> Emily's freedom from her difficult father came when she was 34, and it came with enough money to live on comfortably. Yet she was forever raising funds for some crusade or other. She was very well connected. Her mother, I'm going to put your thumb on, uh, was Caroline Trelawney. Anybody Cornish knows those names? Trelawney. We sing the national anthem of the Cornwall School for Learning. And she enjoyed a close friendship with Leonard Co Courtney, MP for East Cornwall, and Leonard's sister in law, Beatrice Webb, one of the Blue Stocking Potter sisters. Sadly, uh, for Emily, marriage was not a likely option at that time, as I said, women considered old at 30. Um, here's an interesting statistic. In the 1880s, one in three English women remained spinsters, six women. So first of all, she got her bit of money and she dashed off to Virginia City, Minnesota. She wanted to be a missionary uh, for the Cornish miners there and she wanted to stop them drinking. Well, that didn't work at all. Um, but she did meet somebody there, a very handsome man. Can you put up a picture? What happened to her mom? Did you know? <laughs> mom right? Oops. There's, her, there's the, the man who wanted to marry her and wanted to spend all her money and in fact spent a good deal of it and didn't marry her. When you wish the slide changed. Tell me. Yeah, well, you know, so I'm not perfect, right? Yeah. Um, so at any rate, uh, she didn't marry him. But once the Boer War started, initially bringing tremendous British losses at Spian Kop, the Mother River, Majuba, and more, they developed a desperate need for success, particularly for a word of relief of the besieged uh, town of Mapake. So when this was finally achieved in 1900, the exuberant celebrations induced some anti-war backlash. Emily threw herself into the fray, organizing a women's only meeting at Queen's Hall, London, with the resolution that this meeting desires to express its sympathy with the women of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. Oops, this was not very popular. 
so this was really just trying with Emily's personal feelings. The next, she organized an open meeting at Lisker in Cornwall, and here she brought the Welsh MP David Lloyd George, an outspoken critic of the war. Now, does anybody here, does that ring a bell? Do you know who we have in Canada famous relatives of David Lloyd George? Anybody know who they are? And Macmillan. Pardon? Is it uh, Margaret Macmillan? Margaret, yeah. Margaret Macmillan and her sister Anne, who ran the CDC office, she just retired in London. And I must um, say also, Margaret and Anne's mother, and her two brothers, I don't know them, but I know these two. Uh, her mum, who is 93, uh, Lynn Macmillan, is the granddaughter of David Lloyd George. And she helped me uh, save that house that I'm always telling you about. So they're quite the family. And we have them here in Canada. I think that's very nice. The chairman, going back to this Lisbon meeting, was Martha Quilla Cooch. Everybody Cornwall in Cornwall. Cornwall knows those names. So if you're not Cornish, now you do. Quilla Cooch is a, is a big name. He was a writer, academic, big name. The Cornish Times and other papers head, headlined this disastrous outcome. It, the whole thing turned into a riot. There were derisive singings of Trelawney, stamping of feet, and coarse hoops and sh laughter, and chairs were thrown, and blows struck. And Emily stood guard as the others were hustled out. You know, I mean, she, she just stood up for things. She was quite brave. From then on, she became more and more focused on the plight of the war women and children in South Africa. So what did she do next? Well, of course, she was going to go to The author, John Hall, said that farm burnings are central to every story. The British believed that any free stater in arms against the crown counted as a rebel. So between June and November, over 600 farmhouses were destroyed on General Roberts' order. The women and children had to be fed and housed by the British, and the Boers couldn't do it. There were others to be rounded up to, old men unable to fight, and those disillusioned, they called them the hands uppers, and housing them with the bitter enders caused a problem, as you can imagine. It was a scorched earth policy, and it laid the basis for the first concentration camps. And I think many people don't know that the British started concentration camps, so we, we, we can't be too thorny of a about all that. When Kitchener took over command from Roberts, he also destroyed crops, stole cattle, sheep, horses, anything that could sustain life for the Boers, but might be useful for his own army. After the war, the number of deaths told a sorry tale. 27,927 Boers died in the camp. 26,251 women of, and children, of whom over 22,000 were under the age of 16, all men. Overcrowding had led to the usual miserable dysentery, typhoid, diphtheria, and so on. The more Emily read of these circumstances, mostly, we need either, I'm not loud enough? No, no, just a recorder. Oh, you're just late. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, the more Emily uh, really read about this, uh, mostly from soldiers' letters going home, the more she said, I'm going to South Africa. She arrived in Table Bay in December 1900. Everywhere she made useful connections. She really knew how to do this. She was on board ship with the Quaker Roundtree family. In Cape Town, she met with Mrs. Caroline Murray, a descendant of the Cape Colony's first prime ministers. She said about interviewing displaced Boer women. She determined to see Sir Alfred Miller, who was the governor of the Cape Colony and High Commission for Southern Africa. Her letters of uh, introduction achieved this, and she emerged triumphant with promises of two trucks, one for clothing, another for provisions, and permission to visit the camps, so long as Lord Kitchener gave sanction. Well, he didn't. It dogged Emily, his attitude, all through her personal campaign. His, his permission was eventually given to go, but as far as Bloemfontein only. But here she stayed with a Boer family, but ate at the government house. 
that isn't bizarre, I don't know what is. Like so many Victorian and Edwardians, she wrote hundreds of letters. We know as much as we do about Emily's exploits, in part because she wrote constantly to her aunt back in England. Lady Hobhouse, back in Mayfair, she was, and many of these letters still exist. Uh, bell tents on scorched earth, a lack of total shade, filthy water, limited to two buckets a day for a family of seven or eight, for all washing, cooking, and drinking. She wrote, the effluvia is terrible, making it impossible to approach with, within 50 yards without your nose and mouth tied up. She also described the latrines, which were without privacy and open to sun and rain. Soap was unobtainable, and illness and death occurred daily. Camp deaths were as many as 20 or 30 a day. She wrote all this back to England. One day she was sitting in a tent with one family when a puff adder entered. As the family ran out, Emily attacked the creature with her parasol. <laughs> Now, in 1901, Emily planned to return home and start a campaign appealing directly to the British public. Her clothes were filthy and stiff with red dust. Even washing her face and hands had been impossible for days. She booked passage from Cape Town and learned she had a cabin on the same ship as Sir Alfred Milner, another target. She made friends with a prominent Boer couple and then wondered why many people shunned her. But she really didn't get it right. Once home, she plotted to find a meeting with Sir John Broderick, Secretary for War. She was coached by Leonard Courtney, the uh, Liberal MP, and together they made a list to improve the camps. Would, it, would Emily be, be able to stir up more trouble working with the pro-liberals, pro-war liberals, where she forced to remain in England? than if she was permitted to return to South Africa. So they had a real problem here. You, they damned it, they do, and damned it, they do. Anyway, on route home, Emily written a 40-page report for publication. She circulated it in mid-June to the South African Women's and Children's Distress Fund Committee, with a shorter version being distributed to both houses of parliament. I don't know how you get that done. I'd like to try that. <laughs> Um, at any rate, she engineered an interview with the Scottish Liberal MP, Cam Campbell Bannerman, who in turn, much moved by Emily's words, addressed dinner guests at the National Reform Union shortly after. When is a war not a war, he asked them, when it's carried on by methods of barbarism in South Africa. And that phrase, methods of barbarism, and Emily's name were now linked. The press made much of this, and now on, Emily's name became the target, and she began to learn just how many foes she had. She was really on a, she soldiered on a sort of one-woman crusade, and it was not easy. She was going back to, uh, from Southampton, again, to South Africa in September 1901. She tried to sail anonymously, but she made a mistake of asking to be seated at the captain's table. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't last long. <laughs> but when she reached Cape Town, she had a rude awakening. Kitchener and Alfred Miller had joined forces to agree that Miss Hobhouse would not be allowed to land. Mm. What followed for a few days was a scene so farcical it really should be read in detail, as described by John Hall. We'll come back to birds again. Uh, she was she requested she was requested by a mere lieutenant, lieutenant speaking on behalf of the colonel to either stay on this ship pending its return voyage or transfer to another ship called the Rosling Castle, leaving in two days' time. She set to work writing letters to everyone she knew. The captain of the ship was extremely embarrassed and would become more so. She pleaded illness at the same time as she braced for battle. Knowing that soldiers hate guarding women, she asked for a guard, and then she asked for a washerwoman. She asked for parole, was not granted, and she was attended. The colonel went on board to persuade her. She prepared to make a scene, and the colonel backed off. Emily refused to move, claiming ill health again. A senior medical man is sent to see her and tell her that the transfer would not be delayed. 
Emily, having been warned that force would be used, became theatrical. She's already theatrical. <laughs> she was, it was most unnerving. She is warned of unpleasant consequences. Next, two stalwart-looking women came in to physically remove her. But she called on their sympathy and womanhood. This pandemic went on for some hours, and Emily was exhausted, but the word was she's got to be moved that day. Finally, exactly as she'd been warned, as she had been warned, would happen. Two stretcher bearers entered the cabin. She appealed to their chivalry. She fought. She struggled. They lifted her bodily and tied her down. She was carried off the ship to a waiting carriage. On the quayside, she felt humiliated as dark lovers jeered and booed. And on November the 8th, the news of her unladylike deportation broke in the English newspapers. They branded her arrest there, a shameful indignity to a noble-hearted woman. Well, some did, let's face it, some did. So her friends debated whether to go with the meter at Roslyn Cup, this Roslyn Cup, the ship. And in the end, Leonard and Kate made the trip to Southampton. You know, People, she wrote a book after the war. She wrote a book called The Brunt of War. But she finished it in 1902, unaware that the previous night at Melrose House in Pretoria, the, war had, the, the Boer War had been signed and finished. So she headed out to South Africa. She, she, she traveled in first class. She actually wasn't very well. She found herself ostracized by all these passengers. They were fed up with her. And, uh, but when she got to Cape Town, she was hosted and she had a great time. And then she decided she, she'd have to do more. She'd go and look at these, whatever, how people were living at the end of this dreadful uh, war. Uh, she was embarrassed to be perceived by the wealthy and all their finery while she arrived from trekking miles covered in red dust. The horror stories she listened to took a toll, but she continued her barrage of criticism and sent screams back to England. Of course, all the while she was trekking, she, trekking, she was distributing food and clothing and other aid. And when she ran out of money, she turned to a di direct appeals in South Africa and Britain. You may have noticed there's no word of blacks, their camps and their misery. Blacks did suffer, of course, and Emily on more, more than one occasion divided up what food and provision she had. So she did something for them, but perhaps it was not high on her priority. Um, one of the most inspired ideas she has, she had, was to purchase teams of, of oxen and they could be sent from farm to farm plowing through the country districts. Uh, she, um, she, she, she made two great friends, one Jan Smuts that we have mentioned, and the other a woman called Olive Schreiner, who was a celebrated novelist and personality and women's rights campaigner. Emily and, and Smuts, who she came to refer to as my dear Um Jali, remained friends and correspondents till the end of her life. Emily planned to return to England, and it should have been a simple arrangement. It didn't work out that way. She was, but then she was too ill to board the ship. However, she struggled and friends helped her, and she made it, be, she made it back home. But she got another little inheritance, so 1905, she starts out again. This time she had the idea to set up spinning and weaving and lace-making centers as money-making enterprises for poor women. Uh, she'd actually made one big mistake. She was rushing out there, and her aunt, who had been her faithful correspondent, originally intended to leave her a big pile of money. But the aunt was ill and said to Emily, please come, and Emily didn't. When the aunt died, that money had shrunk. So there, there is a lesson for everybody, I guess. Um, so she went out, and she... Let, let's see here. She was at Christmas. She went out in 1905. Uh, and she tried to start up this business of spinning and weaving. I don't think it, at least maybe, I don't think it really took off. But she did, in England at this time, it was the women's suffrage movement. So, of course, Emily's right in the middle of all that again. 
uh, and she went to a rally at the Albert Hall that December, and over 11,000 people were there to applaud her. This was the era of the Pankhurst and the Millicent Garrett Fawcett. Um, in 1913, something really exciting happened. The President of South Africa announced that a national monument in honor of the concentration camp dead, a great cemetery, was being built south of Lomfontein. Emily was asked to perform the unveiling. Ooh, that was the boyfriend. Forget him. He was the last cause. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know, they're not in proper order, I know. That was mom, and that was, that was the house where she, uh, she bought, 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 that was the rectory, having a rock, it's an E, which is spelled I, but pronounced E, and this is her father. Anyway, uh, let me see. So she was asked to perform this Alvele. And the Bertha, I, prom I don't know how you pronounce it, Bertha, first premier of the Union, and Stein would share the platform with her. I mean, how amazing is this? And the sculptor deferentially consulted Emily regarding the group of this obelisk. But naturally, Emily disapproved. And <laughs> in, in the end, her health really gave out. She couldn't get down there to do this, and she had to limp home. By then, she was really in trouble uh, from the point of view of health. But guess who her great friend became? Gandhi. Gandhi was in South Africa. He was so impressed because she was doing, she wanted to get people to do spinning and weaving and lace, lace making. Everybody knows what Gandhi is spinning. So he became, he became her great friend. He went to see her off when she left for England. And he, re he remained in, a correspondent with Emily until the end of her life. But the end of her life wasn't too long in coming, actually. Um, she she dis decided she'd go back to Cornwall. She felt very torn between South Africa, England, and Cornwall. So, at any rate, there she goes off to Cornwall. And she looks, that's the aunt that was going to leave the money. She didn't get very much. She should have gone. Um, but before she went, it was the beginning of the First World War. In June of 1916, this was her big thing. I'm going out there, and I'm going to see those Nazis, and I'm going to persuade them not to, not to come in with war. How ridiculous is this, too? Uh, but she did get to Switzerland, and she did talk to the higher command, and she said she got a piece of paper to take back to England to show that we were negotiating. Anyway, she lost the piece of paper, so she wasn't in very good shape at that point. Um, the Germans escorted her back to England, uh, and she looked apparently at some of the German prisoner war camps, and she said they, they were not nearly as bad as the British concentration camps. Oh dear, what a character. So she was taking this message to England, but she lost it. At the time she was 60, she was really quite bored. Yes, yeah, she was. She was. And that was just at the end of the ball point. So I think we have a picture of this, Gandhi. And here she is at 60. She's not doing well. And she was in London. People came to her rescue, and they cut into here, and they cut into there. But, you know, it wasn't really going to happen anymore. But she did start fundraising again for funds for enemy children. And this was later merged, and you'll never believe what it became. It became Save the Children. Would you believe that's what the Save the Children mm -hmm. The Princess Royal runs the show. <coughs> Emily had been thrilled to hear the Princess Royal was now running her fun. So we can say she had a genius for using her well being connections and for fundraising. And, and she, she did have a genius for all this. And she was just extraordinary. And I think she probably must have, when you hear this, you think, was this poor woman bipolar? Possibly, but she certainly, she, she just got these enthusiasms. She, she got money, she got connections. It's extraordinary. She 
not wrong with it, but I don't have, that's for sure. So she was broke again by 1921. She was saved by the news of a public subscription from her South African admirers, the equivalent. This was the subscription, equivalent of 77,000 pounds today. So somebody cared about it. So she bought a house in Sudai, and I think we have a picture of it somewhere. Well, this is the funeral in South Africa. And you think, in Cornwall, she was stuck in the ground. But you see, I'm not quite sure how that happened. I think this was just a commemoration uh, funeral uh, with a curate. Do it right. Uh, anyway, she bought, with the money, she bought um, a house on a hill that was overlooked by Virginia Woolf's old house, old home, Talon House. So then she went to live in St. Ives, as opposed to St. Eve, where she grew up. But yet, she wasn't happy there. She was lonely. She moved back to London. She suffered angina, asthma, pleurisy. And in the end, she wrote to Jan Smuts, you say I belong to a conquering race, but only half of me is Anglo-Saxon. The other half is Celt, pushed away by the conquerors into the remote Cornish hills, where ever since my family, in unbroken line, have lived, never feeling one with the rest of England. And uh, she was rescued by a friend, realizing the severity of her condition, it took her by ambulance to London, she died the 8th of June, 1926. Four men. Mm -hmm. I cut it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's impossible to tell everybody's life quickly. Have our letters been published? Oh, I don't know. John Hall would not. Should I know John Hall? Well, no, but I mean, you know, Google it. That's what I do. Yeah, I have his book. I have his book. I have it. I'll lend it to you. Yeah. Anybody can borrow it, for sure. Yes, yeah, very interesting. But it's so complicated that when you ask me, somebody asked me to cut it down, it really is hard because she does this, and then she does that, and then she does this. Yeah. It's just endless. Yeah. Endless. Yeah, I'd like to see the bibliography. Uh, I didn't bring the book tonight, but uh, anybody can see it if you want. Yes? Uh, they weren't Nazis. They were politely called the Harlems. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm corrected. <laughs> well, I was going okay, to they were not, so yeah, you're absolutely right, they weren't Nazis. No, they're right, they were the Huns, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure which is the compliments and which not. This is the hum singular, wasn't it? One of the hum. The hum, the actual yeah. Sorry. Well, I'm just curious, how, why would so many respectable people throughout her life receive her? Because she was completely scandalous. Yes, she was. So how could she still maintain... She had, I think it was the fantastic connection she had. Okay. She had connections... Uh, in the aristocracy, in the government, mm -hmm. in both governments, mm -hmm. and in South Africa, smarts. It's extraordinary. Yeah, it's 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 she would have been a, a <laughs> to me, I would have thought that people would, would stay away from her. Because well, some did. A whole lot of them did. I mean, they shunned her on the boat, but on several boats. Isn't it more common in, in British society that degrees of madness that would end up in incarceration in Canada or Tennessee, I just looked upon as peculiarities. <laughs> That's true, they celebrate eccentricity. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but, but she had that drive, she had a phenomenal drive, which I really admire. And you know, when you think there was that tremendous, where well, people were throwing chairs down at this cup, and she's standing, holding back the mob, and people like Lord George are scurrying out of the back door. No, but she, she really had a vision, didn't she? she and, and I think, um, you know, she was so ahead of her time to think of providing uh, the tools for people to learn a skill. You know, and, and this is what is proved to be so successful today in developing countries. 
Well, that's right. She was mm -hmm. ahead of her. I hadn't thought of that. I, I almost didn't put that part in, actually. And then I thought, well, I have to, because I have to link it to Gandhi, you see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, that's extraordinary that Gandhi would be writing to her at the end of her days, mm -hmm. and that Smuts would. It's just... Are there any memorials to her in, in Britain? In Cornwall. Only in Cornwall. <laughs> well, I'm just teasing you. Oh. Uh, I don't think so, but I think there should be. I, I mean, there should be a blue plaque on that house she had down there. Getting blue plaques is very difficult, I try. So, so, so when was she living in South Africa? When she died in 26? No, she died in London. Well, she, she died in London, right? Yeah, she, then she moved to the Isle of Wight. I mean, she was hopping about all over this. Actually, I didn't mention that I have time, but she lived in Italy for a while. And she lived upstairs in a wheelchair, and she paid people to lug her all the way downstairs in a wheelchair. It's quite she, bizarre. But she was in South Africa for some extended period. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but, but often reviled. So she would stay with one side, and then she would eat with the other side. It was ridiculous, <laughs> but she did it. So, so thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, yeah. I'm sure uh, this is... <laughs> a significant speech he was caught. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then maybe, well, maybe, well, maybe well, that's what we should do. We should, as the TCA, we should... Get a monument for her. Yeah. 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 I would also like to thank <laughs> the Kelly Library for yeah. allowing yeah. us yeah. to be here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I've written and thank Michael in the minutes of the last meeting <laughs> uh, for our picnic, and I would thank him now as being our main contact and has been a great help uh, with the exhibition and this evening and, uh, and the cataloguing, which is which is his job. It's cataloging is wonderful. Okay. Can I remind everybody to put two dollars in for the... Does anybody want to grab a copy to go home with or anything like that? I will be